So my goal today then is to um, derive for you the Doppler peaks in the CMB, how they depend on parameters, or at least some examples of the dependencies on parameters. Um, so again, what we're talking about is the fact that uh, if you look at the cosmic microwave background and, and uh, you look at the amplitude of fluctuations as a function of scale, you, in Fourier space you discover this very nice uh, set of uh, peaks which we use to determine a lot of the cosmological parameters because even though we started with scale invariant initial conditions, a bunch of processes have put into this thing uh, Various scales. There's some scale of the of the of the um, of the period of those oscillations. There's some damping. There's uh, matter radiation equality, etc., which we discussed last time. So that's what I that's that's the goal of the lecture. Last time uh, I finished by talking a little bit about recombination. Okay. So what were the things that I said? Um, if you look at the fraction of um, of uh, electrons as the universe cools down. What happens around a redshift of 1,000 is that uh, all of the electrons that uh, were around end up forming hydrogen atoms. So if you write here the, the fraction of electrons that are the free electrons are supposed to be in hydrogen atoms. This goes from 1 to 0 very fast around a redshift of 1,000. Um, and I showed you the plot. And those of you who looked at the plot a little bit more carefully saw that uh, at least the way I was showing the plot, this uh, thing went above one and had little steps and so on. Instead of being this, it was like this. this anyway. And all of that is uh, just a convention. It's because of the um, electrons from helium that uh, helium first recombines the first electron, then the second electron, and much before the actual recombination of hydrogen, this happens, or somewhat before. And uh, in this way of... Uh, of defining the ratio by just dividing by the number of protons as opposed to the total num protons in hydrogen atoms as opposed to all the protons, uh, you get this above one. But that's just the uh, usual naming conventions that become strange uh, in astronomy. So, uh, okay, so that was recombination. What we said was that uh, we also looked at the mean free path of photons and realized that. Uh, because uh, before recombination there were so many free electrons that uh, the mean free path for photons was much shorter than the horizon and I showed you the plot of this thing shooting up as uh, the mean free path uh, that is shooting up as the f number of free electrons goes down and making the universe basically transparent and by that I mean that the mean free path of uh, photons uh, for Thomson scattering uh, becomes much larger than Hubble. A few comments that I wanted to make sure I, uh, I, um, I said, I, I think I already said this. This happens when the temperature is around 0 0.3 eV. This is larger than 13 point, uh, smaller than 13.6 eV. The reason being the photon to baryon ratio is so large in our universe. There are so many photons for each baryon that even in the tail of a black body distribution at this temperature, there is enough photons to keep um, hydrogen ionized, uh, and if you were to, so, so if you wanted to uh, compute this curve, so just so that we start talking about parameter dependencies, if you wanted to compute this curve, what it depends upon? It depends upon just uh, the physics of the hydrogen atom, uh, energy levels of the hydrogen atom, and this photon to baryon ratio, that's it. And the dependence on the photon to baryon ratio is pretty mild because you're, you are in this tail of the exponential uh, for the distribution of the photons at this time. So if you change the number of, of, um, of hydrogen atoms that this, uh, that, this, um, that this black body spectrum needs to keep ionized, you don't need to change the temperature by a lot in order to make a big change in how many uh, photons there are above 13.6 eV. So the, dep the actual dependence on the redshift of, uh, of recombination on the photon to baryon ratio or on omega bh square, remember that we said that in physical densities, number densities are, or, mat or energy densities are proportional to these omegas times the little h square, not the omegas. So in terms of that, which, so this uh, redshift, so this uh, temperature is pretty much set by the physics of the hydrogen atom 
and the photon to baryon ratio, but the dependence on this is pretty small. It's just logarithmic. So, um, and by just because uh, if you double the, 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 say, the amount of uh, hydrogen atoms that you need to keep ionized, you don't need to double the temperature. You make a small change or in the tail of the exponential and you compensate for it, okay? So this redshift of, of uh, recombination is pretty much fixed to be 1100 or whatever it is with a very weak dependence on, on this parameter, okay? And uh, given that we, so what, what is fixed is the temperature of the universe at the time of recombination, pretty much fixed because we measure the, the temperature of the universe today directly measuring the CMB. We know this redshift pretty accurately, okay, just from there. So he, this has pretty much no parameters. And, um, okay, yep. Um, the, 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 the reason that what? The, the, the number of electrons is the same. Well, the number of, yeah, so the universe is composed of hydrogen atoms and a little bit of helium atoms. If it just was hydrogen atoms, it can, the, it can be proton and electron or hydrogen atoms. So. Um, so, so, if, so this is temperature 0 0.3 EV, and we arrive to here in a situation in which pretty much there are some helium atoms, a small amount of them, let's forget about them if you want, and there's just protons, electrons, or hydrogen atoms. So you, you go from protons and electrons, there's some reaction that takes you into hydrogen atoms and a photon, and you're in thermal equilibrium. At temperatures much below this, this makes you be all in uh, protons plus electrons later, hydrogen atoms, but uh, you have to, yeah, the universe is neutral. That won't change the total charge, though. You can that. Yeah, the, the universe has to be charged. So I leave you as an, ex uh, have you in neutral, I leave you as an exercise to try to build cosmologies of a fully charged uh, universe. Uh, no, but uh, yeah, it is. Um, of course, uh, these and, all, and many of the other, th and many of the more things that I will be talking about are, of course, a natural consequence of the fact that we live in the landscape and of the scale factor measure. So if you just take those two things, you probably can derive everything. <laughs> uh, but I have to go more mundanely and try to work things through. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't make fun of people. <laughs> Even if they're not here. <laughs> Given that you asked me, I had to make fun of you. Anyhow. Um, okay, so I said that, um, and um, good, so this is all pretty much fixed um, in terms of parameters. And then just a follow up on this question, if, uh, if you want to get a, a simple estimate from when this happened, you can assume it's happening in thermal equilibrium and to, you get the, the beginning of the thing reasonably right, so you can write a distribution function for a non-relativistic, so you can write the, uh, uh, distribution functions for the protons, the electrons, the hydrogen atoms for a, uh, um, a non-relativistic particle. This has the form, the mass of the particle times the temperature to the three halves, e to the minus the mass over t, you can write, and the minus the chemical potential, sorry. Okay, so anyway, I'm not going to spend much time, but the number density of each of them, and if they are in thermal equilibrium, uh, and because of this re reaction, the chemical potentials need to uh, satisfy some relations, so you can use that to solve for the fraction, the ionization fraction as a function of time. That's called the Saha equation, and you will, uh, you, you can get such things easily. And there you will see immediately, if you, if you did that exercise, you would see immediately that, uh, that the dependence, of course, on the, on the baryon density is pretty low because of the very high photon to baryon ratios, as I said. Okay, so um, sounds good. So we have recombination. So what we are trying to do then is figure out the state of the universe at that time because at that time um, the universe will become transparent and the photons will start going in every direction until they hit our telescope. So what we need to do then is uh, we will solve the equations for uh, the density perturbations in, uh, in the FRW background. So just uh, just to... Remind you then, we will write our FRW background. Just like this. In 
formal coordinates. And in fact, the solution for uh, A of uh, tau in the, co in the context that we are talking about, so uh, the, the other thing that we discussed is that this is happening at a ratio of 1,000. In most situations, uh, and definitely for this talk, dark energy is totally, or the cosmological constant is totally irrelevant at that time. However, the epoch of matter radiation equality comes pretty close to the to recombination. Again, another fact that follows from same principles as before, uh, measure plus uh, plus uh, the landscape. But it's, it is the case that um, that uh, matter radiation equality happens uh, very very much. Uh, near recombination, so recombination happens at a ratio of 1,000. And, um, and uh, matter radiation equality happens a little bit before in our universe, just uh, around 3,000 or so. But the solution for A of tau um, in a universe filled with matter and radiation that uh, even including the fact uh, that uh, you go from one to the other, you can find it analytically. Um, there's no, I can, I can write it if you want. So A over A equality. Okay, let me just write it here. So, A, sorry, A over. And this we can, we can, uh, we can uh, use, so it's of the form alpha times x squared plus uh, two alpha x, where alpha, is just defined to be as the ratio. The, the, the relevant thing would be the ratio of the scale factors at, at matter radiation equality and at recombination. So that's this parameter alpha. And x is defined to be um, tau divided by um, so this is uh, almost uh, just uh, dimensional analysis. But, um, to, to, to do. Maybe there's a two here, something like this. Um, so where this uh, this this thing is just the what tau would be at a of recombination if the universe was just matter dominated all the time. So this is tau of recombination for a matter dominated universe, and in terms of tau over that value, then a of a of a over a equality is just given by this, and alpha is just the ratio of that of those two things and um, Oh, no. So that there's an analytic solution for that. So the important thing then for us again is that uh, that um, this uh, epoch of equality will just depend on this param again this parameter omega matter times h square. Okay, so that's the parameter that sets when matter radiation happens in terms of the parameters that describe the energy density of the universe today. And uh, so, or e equivalently, the ratio of the age of the universe at recombination over the age of the universe at equality is just a function which you can easily calculate of omega matter h square. Okay? Good. So now what we need to do is take our FRW universe and perturb it a little bit and follow the linearized equation for those perturbations. That's the goal. Um, I will stick to uh, perturbing a flat FRW, bag FRW background. This uh, buys me the fact that then the background is, uh, does not depend in, this, in, in the coordinates manifestly doesn't depend on, on position. And so but I can just do everything in Fourier space. The whole thing looks uh, translationally invariant. And so I can just expand everything in Fourier modes, treat one Fourier mode at a time, and be happy. If I have... Uh, if I were dealing with a uh, open and clo or closed uh, FRW metric, I will just need to do, do a little bit more work because it do, it's not manifestly the case that uh, that uh, nothing depends on on space, and so I will not be able to use Fourier modes. But it's not a big deal. But for me, for these lectures, it will be easier. So basically, what I will try to do is imagine that I have uh, the initial conditions of the universe, and we discussed the other time, and we will talk more today that uh, these perturbations that we are solving are from, uh, coming from the initial conditions. We will imagine that there is one single Fourier mode okay, uh, in the initial conditions, and then we will superimpose the answer that we will get uh, as a superposition of the answers for many Fourier modes. I, I will imagine that I'm here at the center somewhere. There's these initial fluctuations of density 
or the gravitational potential is positive, negative, positive, negative in planes perpendicular to the K-mode. I will let that thing evolve and imagine then that I'm sitting here and eventually I'm looking at this universe and trying to make a map of the temperature that I would observe as I look in different directions. Sometimes they will correspond to what initially was an overdensity or an underdensity, okay? So as a function of angle on the sky, I will see a map of temperature that will depend on the Fourier mode, okay? Then if I have a lot of Fourier modes and I want to make the final map that I would observe, I just add the maps of corresponding to each Fourier mode um, with uh, using the individual uh, amplitude of that specific Fourier mode in the initial conditions, okay? So that's, that's the goal. So I will then, I, I need to start with some uh, initial conditions in Fourier space and, uh, and solve for those. Sorry. Not good. Okay, so um, okay, so now let me let me spend uh, half a second or half a minute or whatever talking about uh, uh, if I want to do this in practice now, I need to pick a gauge. Okay, I need to decide how I'm going to write down the perturbations in the metric, what coordinate system I would uh, look, I would use. I mean, it's obvious that uh, that. Um, I need to be a little bit careful or that uh, I, there might be more than one way of, of doing things. It, it just, uh, just to be totally dumb about it, you can take a flat FRW, just an unperturbed universe, make a small uh, space and time dependent coordinate transformation. You're describing the exact same thing, but the, the metric will not, uh, you know, will not look unperturbed. It will look that there will be a little perturbations, okay? And so, uh, um, and so, of course, nobody will solve the homogeneous universe unperturbed FRW in some coordinates in which things depend on space and time for no good reason. However, when you have a perturbed universe, then, you know, what do you do? How do you know? I mean, maybe you're putting in a little bit of this fake, uh, of this fake coordinate transformations uh, just uh, without noticing. Now you cannot find a coordinate system in which the metric looks like so nice everywhere. So you need to make some choices, and there are many choices. What I will do, so, and uh, uh, those choices you, you, you have uh, used, uh, several of those choices, some of the very nice choices you've used, uh, especially for computing um, the, um, the, energy, the density perturbations from inflation, the so-called zeta gauge, for example, you used. Very nice. In the zeta gauge, you make, there's a scalar field in inflation. You make that uh, scalar field uh, be unperturbed. You make the spatial part of the metric just be proportional to delta j. That fixes everything, and at least the scalar part. I'm, I will, for the moment, I will just be talking about the scalar fluctuations, okay? Um, that fixes everything, very nice, and very nice Lagrangian, everything is beautiful, zeta is conserved outside the horizon, etc. I will not use the zeta gauge. Um, why I will not use the zeta gauge? I will not use the zeta gauge for a few reasons. First, uh, unfortunately for me, um, I have, or maybe not so unfortunately, for, uh, but for the calculational purposes, uh, unfortunately, the universe is filled with more than one kind of fluid, okay? So in the case of inflation, I have a very simple prescription. There is the inflaton. I choose the surfaces. As time, I choose the surfaces in which the inflaton is, uh, is unperturbed, and I go from there. But here, what do I choose? The density, the total density, the dark matter density, the photon baryon fluid density, they would all give me different slices. And because these guys, these different fluids will be moving in different directions, these slices, or differently, they, some of these fluids have pressure, other ones don't, these slices do not coincide. So already from there, it's not, um, the logic is not so nice. Uh, but furthermore, I mean, the beautiful thing about the zeta gauge, uh, or one uh, nice thing, is that the zeta gauge, um, uh, well, in this zeta gauge, all the perturbations are in the metric, okay? So you're just following. Maybe that's not beautiful. Maybe that's a bad thing. But in any case, all, all the perturbations are in the metric. Um, and this is very bad for uh, doing structure formation. Why is this very bad for doing structure formation? Because uh, what happens when structure forms? Well, you start forming a blob of matter, say a galaxy, 
uh, collapses. Gravitational, so let's talk in Newtonian language. The gravitational potential is still very small, 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 7. So there's nothing, there's no nonlinearity, no gravitational nonlinearity. GR is totally irrelevant for this purpose. I can just do Newtonian gravity, I'm inside the horizon. In the zeta, but however, the density contrasts are humongous, okay? In the zeta gauge, everything looks like a metric perturbation. So suddenly, I don't know what to do. I have to think deeply about what I'm doing, except in the Newtonian gauge, I, it's clear I just do Newtonian gravity, and the, the, the fact that something is, the density is getting large does not, does not complicate anything. I'm just solving Newton's law or the hydrodynamic equation. So, so zeta gauge break, apparently breaks down, the, you get, you know, the, the coordinate system basically breaks down when you get to the nonlinear scale, but nothing really bad is happening because all that, so imagine if you take surfaces of constant density as your clock, okay? When you form an object, it forms, it gets to some density, it doesn't evolve anymore. You lost your clock. The density, before you were say, I use, at each point, I'll use the density at this point, match it to the background FRW universe to, to define what the time is. At this, but if the density is not evolving anymore, you've lost your clock, but nothing bad is happening. So zeta gauge is not so good. So uh, uh, for, for me, it will be bad to try to do the zeta gauge. Um, so I will just use what I think is the uh, second most uh, uh, simple thing. It's called the Newtonian gauge. So. Um, and, and at least uh, the, in the Newtonian gauge, everything looks like new, the Newtonian equations inside the horizon, okay? So I will just need, I, I will live with terms in the Euler equation or the fluid equations that look uh, non-Newtonian when I'm talking about uh, scales that are outside the horizon. But other than that, all the intuition that I may have uh, gathered by solving simple things uh, in flat space and in the, in the Newtonian limit, I will easily... I will easily recover. So I will use that. In the Newtonian gauge, then, uh, the, 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 what I will just uh, do then, so very long story then for just saying that what, the way I'm going to write this. In the Newtonian gauge, there are just two potentials. Okay, and uh, so phi and psi, you even for the most part, phi and psi even will be the same, uh, but this depends on the stress energy tensor of what fills the universe. Um, and that's it, so these are, this is how I'm going to write, uh, I'm going to specify uh, metric fluctuations. If you care about it, I mean, and it's uh, related to this by a just simple time uh, diffeomorphism. And in particular, if uh, this phi of the Newtonian gauge is simply related to zeta outside the horizon, then for modes outside the horizon, it's just uh, given by this, okay? So if you, um, so W is the, if you are outside the horizon, So you do the time uh, diff to go from this gauge to the zeta gauge and you match the variables and that's what it is. And so for example, uh, phi does not have the nice property of being conserved outside the horizon like zeta. So during any period in which the, in which the equation of state remains constant, yes, there's a simple relation between phi and zeta. But if the equation of state changes, uh, phi changes outside the horizon, remember zeta is conserved. Um, so it's not so nice in that respect. For talking about uh, things outside the horizon is definitely not nice, but okay, I need to. Um, yeah, zeta is, is, not, is not good for talking about uh, things inside the horizon. And of course, all of the scales that I'm talking about, all of these peaks, all of the physical things are inside the horizon stuff. So I need to work with something that's good inside the horizon. Um, okay. Um, yeah, let, let me just. Um, yes. So, do, 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 there. Um, 
Yeah, the, 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 you know, another option uh, other than fi fi fixing uh, some gauge would be to use the so-called gauge invariant variables, but uh, those gauge invariant variables, I don't know, they're not so, they're usually they're just the phi and psi of the Newtonian gauge. So, so it's just rewriting all your equations in such a way that you are using phi and psi of the Newtonian gauge, for example. And, that you, and then you call it gauge invariant because in any gauge you can compute what phi and psi of the Newtonian gauge would have been if you're working in the Newtonian gauge. So that's <laughs> definitely a gauge invariant uh, statement. Anyhow, so what do I need to do now? So, so what I need to do is to write down the equations for all of the different fluids that, or the different things that I have. I have dark matter. I have the photons. I have the, the electrons and the protons. Okay, I have... I have the neutrinos, and I might have other things. But we'll stick with this. Uh, for the purpose of this uh, class, I will pretty much uh, forget about the neutrinos, OK? Um, the dark matter, I will, treat, I will treat correctly. And for the photons and the electrons and the protons, I will do the following approximation. So remember that. Uh, we looked at this plot, and I, I hope you still have it, of the mean free path of the um, CMB photons in the presence of this uh, high, uh, ionized hydrogen. It was much smaller than the horizon. And it was also very small. It starts out, at least, being very small compared to, the, to the, uh, even the wavelength of the fluctuations that we're interested in studying. So the But however, at recombination, uh, this changes dramatically, and um, the... Um, the, the, the photons no longer interact uh, with the electrons and the protons. So what I will do is make the approximation that this happens very fast, okay? And so I will treat the collection of these guys to be a single fluid and moving together in, 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 in a sense uh, before recombination. So uh, they usually call the photon baryon fluid. And then after recombination, each of them will move separately, instantaneously. That will be the simplest thing, the simple thing that I will assume, okay? So then what I need to do, then I will be following just two fluids, two things, the dark matter and this. So before recombination, then I will have to follow two things, the dark matter and this combined fluid. Each of them, so important point, each of them, so these two are inside this fluid, uh, yeah, they're interacting uh, through the, through, through just Thomson scattering, but uh, between this fluid and this fluid, they are just interacting gravitationally. So the, the energy momentum tensor of each of these fluids is, is conserved separately. Okay, so what I need to do is write down this equation in the Newtonian gauge for each of these fluids, okay? And I will get a conservation equation for each of them. In, in fact, uh, it, uh, you can uh, easily um, write uh, down the conservation equations for any fluid if, if you're giving, given its equation of state, P versus rho. And in reality, you don't just need P versus rho, but you need to know if you make a change in the density, what's the corresponding change in the pressure, usually called the sound speed, so the sound or sound speed square, which is the ratio of the changes in the pressure to the changes in the density, okay? So given these two things, um, you can just write down uh, the, what amounts to the continuity equation and, uh, and the Euler equation for the fluids. So if I will define delta to be the change in the density over the mean density of any given fluid. So for a fluid with these two things, you end up with uh, the following uh, um, in the Newtonian gauge. You end up with the following equation. Let me just write down, let me just write them down just once at least. Uh,
Okay. Okay, and where I've defined then delta to be delta to be delta the change in the density over the mean density and theta is just the divergence of the velocity of this of this fluid. Okay? And I'm only talking about the scalar fluctuation, so that's why the velocity can only, I don't need to keep track of the curl of the velocity field because I'm just talking about scalar fluctuation. So the velocity is the gradient of somebody, so I just need to track, for example, theta, the divergence of the velocity. These are the, the um, these are just the continuity equation and the, equation, the Euler equation for, the, for this fluid. And this is valid for both uh, the, the dark matter and the photo invariant fluid, provided you choose the appropriate W and sound speed square for each of them, okay? So there's four equations, if you want, that you need to solve. Uh, these two equations for the dark matter, these two equations for the um, photon baryon fluid. In the case of the photon baryon fluid, for example, what you need to figure out is the sound speed square. In this case, the, the pressure is just provided by uh, the, the photons, but the energy density um, is, uh, so W, for example, let me do W. So the ratio of the pressure over the energy density is just this. Right? Um, where rho B is, uh, energy density in the photon baryon, in the baryons, in the photons, the pressure coming from the photons. So this is W. So both of these things, W and sound speed square, are just, if the baryons were negligible, this would be one third, okay? Which is not so bad an approximation for us, but it's not quite, uh, um, so both of these things, for the photon baryon fluid, they would be one third, times corrections, different ones, you should, I leave you as an exercise to try to work out exactly what these two things are, but uh, it would be one third and then some function of uh, just what? The, the density of baryons over photons, that ratio, okay? And that ratio is again some function of omega b h squared, okay? I'm try as, as I started saying the other time, omega b h squared is the number density of photons. So both of these things are close to one third, not quite. They depend on time because this ratio depends on time, okay? Yeah? Why do I need a minus sign? Where is a minus? Here? Oh, this was the over. Sorry. <laughs> no minus. Um, thank you. And this should look familiar to you from... Uh, from uh, you know, just uh, continuity equation. For example, if W is zero, then, and, and, and it, let's forget about any Hubble expansion. So at least in that case, it should be an obvious equation. Delta minus theta. So delta dot minus theta is just the derivative of the density plus the divergence of the velocity equals zero. That's the continuity equation. Same thing for this. And you will, uh, so this is the, velo the, 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 the equation for the force on a, on a fluid element. And you will see that the acceleration equals, okay, a bunch of things that maybe are not so familiar, but this one is the gradient of the pressure, and this one is the gradient of the gravitational potential, okay? So they should, both of, all of these equations should be familiar. Yes? Yeah. Yes, so there is a formula, this, there is this formula usually used. Um, and, uh, and this, so, um, good. So, um, so what needs to go into these equations is, of course, uh, you, you, you're trying, you're, you're using this to calculate the pressure. So you need to know if I change the density a little bit by how much the pressure enters, uh, changes. So the point is what is this, uh, what is this um, ratio? We will be assuming that uh, this, uh, and, and it's an incredibly good approximation, that these uh, that these uh, changes are happening happening adiabatically, very slowly. So, if we wanted to get uh, 
And the expansion of the universe or to this fluid is also very slow. It's also an adiabatic process. So if we wanted to know adiabatically how much pressure, in an adiabatic situation, how much the pressure changes when I change the density, I can just take a look at what happens for, for in, the, in the case of the background evolution. Okay? And so I can, I can make a little bit of a change in time in the background evolution and see by how much the pressure has changed. It has changed by P dot times delta T. This is if I change the temperature, uh, the time by a little bit, by how much the temperature, the pressure has changed in a slow change, in a slow situation like Hubble expansion. The same thing for the density. If you take the ratio of those two things, you get this. So under the assumption that both the, we will see that these uh, equations leads to uh, uh, acoustic type oscillations in this plasma. To the extent that these are happening very slowly, okay, this, the adiabatic sound speed, which is what goes there, can be read off from the, what's happening in the other slow process that's going around, which is the, the, um, the uh, expansion of the universe. Okay, so this is why this relation is used. And, of course, in a situation especially like the one of the photon baryon fluid in which I have W and rows and P's that are changing with time uh, because there are relative things that are changing with time inside of it, like rho B and rho gamma. When I take the ratio of, of P dot over rho dot, I will not get the same thing as P over rho. If I just had photons and P was just one third of rho, if I do P dot over rho dot, what, I will always get the one third, okay? But you can see here that if I do P, so P bar is one third of rho gamma, and, and in the, for the photon baryon fluid, and rho bar is rho gamma plus rho baryon. If I, if I take the dots of this, I will not get one third or something, and I will not also not get the same as the ratio, because one, the rho gamma dot goes as uh, three, uh, four H uh, rho gamma, while this one goes, uh, the rho baryon goes as three H. They redshift differently, okay? Because these two guys redshift differently, sound speed square and W will not be the same, okay? Um, any other question? Okay, so, um, um, so if you wanted to know the properties of the fluid, then what you need to do is solve this equation for the dark matter. For the dark matter, it's easy, right? The W and sound speed square are zero, so that's the easy case. Uh, for the photon baryon fluid, you need to work this out. What is the sound speed and what is the... You, need, you have those four equations, and then you, you need to calculate the gravitational potential, phi and psi. In a situation like this one, so, you, you, so now you just write Einstein's equations, and, and, and you see the equations for phi and psi. They, these are constrained variables, so they basically satisfy uh, you know, a version of Laplacian of phi equals delta rho. Okay, it's just a constrained variable. Um, and you can pick your equation. You can pick the equivalent of... Uh, of the Laplacian equation, or you can pick other combination of the zero, zero, and I, I equation. So there's various different, uh, uh, various different uh, choices that people make. But the bottom line is that you will have the, you, you, if you, given these two equations, you will have an equation for delta, the, uh, the total uh, perturbation in the energy density, which will be the sum of the delta of the, of the photon baryon fluid and the delta of the of the dark matter appropriately weighted because they both do not have the same mean density. And basically, the Laplacian of phi um, uh, will be given by that delta. OK? So, so then you, have, you will have a set of five equations uh, that you need to solve. And this I, I've put as an exercise for you to do because it's very easy to just solve these equations in the, in, in the computer. OK? And it's all based on a, a paper that I cite there by Uro Seljak, who did this uh, simple solution some years ago. Um, and so I, I, will, I, will, I will leave you with that as an exercise. I will not try to solve them. Uh, the, of course, they cannot be solved uh, analytically because all, a lot of these coefficients depend on time, and so you cannot solve them analytically. So at the time, um, yeah, there were there, there were two there were two lines of, uh, and of course also this is not uh, 
is not the full story. In reality, I would need to include neutrinos. I would need to include damping of perturbations that I will talk about in a little while. So, so doing the entire thing uh, analytically or with, it was n never, especially to get a 1% answer, it was never really feasible. But at, uh, at that time, in the early 90s and so on, there were a lot of people trying to come up with, uh, with uh, simplified versions of... Uh, of these equations along these lines, like Uros was doing, and solving those, and maybe then uh, they were fudge factorizing them, which, which by which I mean you find a solution, uh, and it has a it has the dependencies on omega bh square and on k and so on, and then you promote some of these dependencies to a little bit of a fudge factor because you haven't done the full solution, and 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 you fit those by running, you know, full computer calculation. That was the plan at the time. Okay, so, so, but in any case, let's just, uh, let's just uh, see what, what, uh, what we get, okay? So what we get basically, so let's, uh, let's do the standard trick, uh, which uh, for these type of equations, as you know, if you take another derivative of, of the continuity equation, you, it ends up being proportional to the derivative of uh, the divergence of the velocity. You can use the other equation, plug it back in, and you end up with a second, uh, the second time derivative equation for delta for, for, the, for the over density, which is nothing other than uh, an equation for some sort of sound waves, okay? So, uh, um, so you will end up uh, with an equation of the following form for delta gamma, or for which is the delta of the photon baryon fluid, you will end up with an equation of this form. Okay. Um, okay. Let me not uh, let me not exactly write what these things are. So you'll end up with a term that has to do with Hubble friction, if you want, because in in, the, in not an expanding universe, in a gas, you will get this equal to zero, just sound waves, okay? Uh, we, what we will get is a little bit of Hubble friction, and also we have uh, the, the um, gradient of the gravitational potential, the Laplacian of phi. So we will get, inside of this, there are terms that you might not recognize uh, from your intuition, um, Newtonian intuition, because it has, it has gravitational potential time derivatives and so on that are usually very small, but there will also be a term, the Laplacian of, coming from the, from the Laplacian of phi. Okay, so, so this, uh, what you will end up solving is uh, a simple harmonic oscillator in the presence of gravity, okay? So that's, that's what this equation is, okay? And gravity is set by, by, by the energy density of this oscillator itself, okay? So, um, not a complicated uh, system to think about. Um, and so, uh, what, what, will be, what will be the solution to those equations? Okay, the solution to those equations will be uh, just simple uh, um, oscillations, okay? So, um, so, delta gamma will be some sort of cosine of uh, omega t, assuming if all of the, this is of course would be perfectly the case if there would not be time dependent coefficients, like the sound speed would, is actually dependent on time a little bit, this will depend on time. But, so, under that assumption, which is not, not good, but not bad either. And from the continuity equation, the velocity is just the time derivative of the density, so it will go as sine of omega t or something like this. In principle, there's a phase here I can have, okay? So this will be the density and velocity, okay? This is the, so that's uh, uh, pretty much the type of solutions that we would get. But in order to understand what exact, solu what, what are the actual solutions that we're going to get, we need to understand what, what are the initial conditions that we will put into this, uh, into this equation, right? So. Here um, we have uh, the simple time evolution of the amplitude. So let's back up a little bit. So I started with one Fourier mode, okay? And I now know that the photons, for example, satisfy a simple, the pho this photon baryon fluid satisfies a simple um, harmonic oscillator type equation. So if I put some initial conditions, after a while this thing will start to oscillate in time, okay? 
Um, and um, if you just had your, your uh, you know, in, 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 in flat space, uh, like sound waves in the room, the, 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 these two solutions, the cosine of omega t for any phase would be a solution. Or, or you can have a traveling wave e to the i omega t minus kx. So there is a spatial dependence e to the i kx. This is the time dependence. You can g choose any solution that you want. Okay? Um, you know, that, 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 uh, that's definitely the case um, in, uh, for sound waves in the room. It's not the case here. Uh, once we look at, at the details of this equation when uh, things are outside the horizon. So let me tell you the bottom line and then let me tell you uh, how to look at it a little bit better. Um, any questions so far before I move to this? This is, by the way, w w will be one of the, evidence, the strong evidences that we will have that uh, the initial condition, the, that, the, that, that the fluctuations that we see on the sky are not coming from, uh, that, are, that were there at the beginning of, um, of, uh, of, the, of, of the FRW phase, in, at, the, at, at the Big Bang itself, if you want, or whatever, however you want to call it. But they were there from the beginning, OK? So the fact that this phase of these oscillations will be fixed, OK? So uh, any questions? Yeah? Um, of course, I, 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 um, I could choose both. I think here I've uh, chosen uh, conformal time because uh, this k, I didn't put an a, okay? So this, uh, um, because if not, I mean, inside the horizon, if this were, you know, this needs to be the physical k, okay? And so if, because I, didn't, I don't have the a there, these dots are really conformal time. Okay. Any other question? So, um, so the bottom line is, uh, is uh, simple enough. Although these equations look, uh, they have uh, oscillatory solutions inside the horizon. Outside the horizon, that's not the case. The solutions outside the horizon, and by outside the horizon, I mean if you go to sufficiently, um, sufficiently low case in this equation, this term is, uh, is negligible compared to this. This will have a Hubble in here, and so the, the, the solution for this goes from being, it will just be power loss in delta, okay, as opposed to being oscillations, okay? So now we are imagining that, that we put uh, um, some, these initial conditions for this uh, Fourier mode, so I'm now to plotting as a function of time, okay, or conformal time, really. I put uh, some initial conditions for this Fourier mode, and I know that inside the horizon, this will be oscillations, OK? And apparently, from, from the knowledge that I have from inside the horizon waves, I could have whatever phase I want, OK? But what happens in this system is the following. If I, have, if I start with these initial conditions, I have two solutions. It's a second order differential equation. But it, the, there are two, two different solutions. One that usually called the grow, a growing mode, and the other one, which is usually called a decaying mode, just because one of them is, gets bigger with respect to the other. The, the, whether the growing mode grows or just is uh, constant or not uh, depends on the gauge. For example, if we are in zeta gauge, um, which is not, it, it will be a convenient thing to do outside the horizon, then the growing mode of zeta is that it's constant. Okay, zeta is constant outside the horizon. And there is the second solution, which decays in time, okay? And so, so it's the same is true during inflation. You had these uh, two modes and one you know, freezes and the other one decays as the mode crosses outside the horizon. So if you have this, um, so if you have this um, um, uh, initial conditions, and even if it was a, a superposition of uh, the growing and the decaying mode, an arbitrary amount of both, as long as you don't put uh, you don't put it 100% uh, into the decaying mode, what will happen? There will be a mode that, so one of the solutions is a constant, one of the solutions decays with time. Uh, and so what will happen is that if you started this fluctuation sufficiently far back, you will be dominated by this solution. Okay, so the sum of the two then 
will, uh, will, will do something like this, and it will match into something here, which is basically the time evolution of the growing mode. If I put sufficient, uh, sufficient uh, distance here, the decaying mode will be totally negligible. Okay, and the answer that I'm going to get is as if I had started the universe entirely in this growing mode, and so this phase of the oscillation as a function of time inside the horizon is absolutely fixed. Okay, I don't have a choice. In the room, by moving the source uh, at a different time in a different way, I can launch waves with the phase that I want. Okay, but if I start this with arbitrary initial conditions in whatever the two solutions that I want. I have the two solutions. Even if I start with arbitrary initial conditions, I will end up with only one thing surviving. And so the, fix, the, the, the wave inside the horizon, the, the face of this wave will be fixed. Okay? Is this clear or not? Yeah? Uh-huh. Um, well, we have, it's a second order differential equation has two solutions, okay? Um, so one will be, and one will, one will, uh, I'm, I, I, I'm calling this a constant because in this gauge, and it just stays more or less constant outside the horizon, but in, in, in other things, like if I plot delta in the synchronous gauge, the, 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 the growing mode actually is growing. So that, but what is true is that there will be power law solutions, and you can see that they, 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 there's no k anymore. So these are just delta double dot, h times delta. These are power law solutions, and one will go faster than the other, okay? And the details of the two, expo uh, uh, um, of the two exponents there is gauge, depends on what you're talking about, okay? Yeah? Yeah, these equations are written in commoving coordinates. Yeah, the k is commoving. Yeah, as I told him, if if uh, I had used uh, this, if this was uh, physical time, then this would need to be physical wave number, and so it should have an a squared underneath. So, in fact, uh, you know, the ones that are more. Um, um, you could, if. If, um, if there was only the radiation era, for example, and I didn't need to worry about, uh, need to worry about uh, matter and radiation and so on, if there was just the radiation era, in fact, I could do the exact same trick to get the action for zeta that you did with uh, Paolo or whoever did the action for zeta, maybe nobody. <laughs> um, for, for the case of this fluid of uh, photons, and you will get the action for zeta will be exactly the same so you, you, you write down, the, you go to the zeta gauge, you solve the constraint equations, you plug it back into the action, the exact same story, and you get the exact same result, okay? You get the same thing. Um, so in terms of zeta, if I just, uh, an epsilon is defined as h dot over h square. So, and, and in fact, you, you probably uh, were discussing this also in the context of uh, inflationary models with different speed of sound. So, So this is the, if I'm in the zeta gauge and there's only one fluid, which is a good approximation of what's going on in the radiation era, because the dark matter doesn't play any role. So if I'm in the radiation era, I would only have one fluid. I could do the, the I could go to the zeta gauge and I can even find the action for the zeta gauge and it's the exact same one as, uh, as, um, as uh, happens um, as during inflation, with the only difference, it, and sound speed here in that case will be exactly one third. And epsilon, the only difference, epsilon is not small, okay? It's order one. Um, yeah? No, they're never important, so, uh, but that's the point. So, uh, but let me just say, so, and, and, the, and, the, and now the equation for zeta is just, uh, you know, the zeta double dot plus 3h zeta dot. This is all true even during the radiation era for the photon variant fluid, so this is probably sound speed square over a square Laplacian of zeta. Okay, this would be, you, if there was only uh, the radiation error, you could solve this problem. I mean, you could continue with zeta. Um, you know, you have inflation, then you have 
some other period of the radiation era with an epsilon and an CS, which are different, but that's all. You, you could do the whole thing like that. And here you, you can see that, okay, in this case, zeta is constant outside the horizon, as we know. And then if you solve this equation now uh, for the other mode, you will see that it decays. Uh, yeah? Yeah. This this is valid. Uh, this is uh, um, yeah. So what 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 this doesn't have is um, is uh, any kind of dissipative process, which is, which is uh, so which is uh, indeed something that does happen, and we will talk about it in the context of the CMB. Okay. So this does not have that, of course, because it's just a Lagrangian a Lagrangian formulation, but. Uh, um, but for the evolution outside the horizon and the fact that I will have, so now if I describe everything in zeta, then it's clear what's gonna happen. Zeta is constant outside the horizon. Or if I put a, a, I have two solutions. One solution, so I have two solutions. One solution has zeta constant, which is when I, when I outside the horizon, when I have this, one of the solution is zeta constant. And then it matches to some oscillations once k over a is of order h, okay? The other solution will be decaying very fast. And, well, zero here is here, here, here sorry. Will be de de decaying, okay? And then it will match eventually to some oscillation here with minuscule amplitude, okay? So even if I start with a linear superposition of the two solutions as much as I want, at the end of the day, I will, have, I will end up in this solution with a phase that is fixed in time, okay? So is this clear or not? Yeah, any? I, I, I'm, uh, I'm uh, comparing uh, the expansion rate with uh, collision times and all of this. So it's not in the, the or even in, in for the purpose of the fluctuations, and I'm, I'm, I'm also assuming not just the Hubble time, but the frequency of these oscillations is also very small. The free, no, 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 because w when I solve this, okay, what is the dispersion relation? Sorry, I should have said that. Omega square inside the horizon, so that term and that term is k square sound speed square, okay? So modes of different uh, k have a frequency just given by this, okay? That's the dispersion relation. So the, this period in time of this oscillation is just given by uh, the sound speed, okay, and k, okay? Yeah? I'm just really mean that the phase I can compute uh, precisely for any K mode, uh, I can tell you what the phase will have to be. And it will, uh, it's not a choice that I have that for a K mode. In, so if I have a, a sound wave, I could decide to launch the sound wave with this K mode with one phase, with the other K mode with some other phase, okay? However, here, the phase is fixed. Every K mode, for example, is oscillating with the exact same time dependence. Every K mode, that, and by that I mean of the same modulus, but different orientations, for example. Let's consider K modes like that one, but with all possible orientations, okay? So if I'm doing here, I have a loudspeaker, I can take the different orientations and I put whatever I want. Okay, phase, in time, okay? In this case, I launch this wave of all the different Fourier modes of the different orientations, but with the same K. They, they will all end up oscillating with the exact same amplitude as a function of time. The frequency is set by the dispersion relation, and the phase is fixed because given that I've started sufficiently outside the horizon, okay, the, the decaying mode has gone totally away, and I have one phase fixed. Okay? So as a function of, even if I start, uh, so in this cartoon, even if I start every K mode with whatever I want here in terms of, uh, of uh, growing and decaying mode, the final, the final inside the horizon, it will go something like this, cosine omega t, plus a phase that I can calculate by figuring out how it's matched and so on. Okay, a fixed phase that does not depend on each K mode, it's not random, I cannot pick it, okay? It's fixed, okay? Is this clear or not? This is important. So because I'm starting outside the horizon, the phase 
So the time dependence of different Fourier modes, and this is maybe sound speed times k, the time dependence of different Fourier modes is fixed inside the horizon to be something, okay? In particular, for example, there's particular points in time when all Fourier modes of the given wave vector, not the given modulus, go to zero at the same time, okay? There's no choice because the phase is just fixed for everybody given by this matching and so on. Let's call it zero for practical purposes, okay? So let's just de redefine the phase such that I'm calling it zero, whatever matches to this, okay? Redefine the origin of time a little bit, yeah? Yeah, the amplitude of each of them is, uh, is uh, a random thing. I can start with whatever, uh, in this, in this uh, context, I can start with whatever amplitude I want, but given that amplitude, the time dependence will be fixed, okay? And so if, if, if I pick a time such that this is zero, it's zero for everybody, okay? This is the important point. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm talking about this situation in which I put exactly that's uh, the point that I will make e eventually. Um, this is all true because I'm fixing the initial conditions, okay? So what, l let me f move forward fast and then we will go more slowly. But what's the story? So when I look at this uh, maximum and minimum of the Doppler peaks, what will happen is that at a given angular scale, I'm looking at modes of a fixed k and changing the value of k as I move in L to smaller and smaller scales. As I do that, I'm, and I'm looking at this at a specific point in time, recombination. So let's say that here is recombination. So I have this mode with this, it ends up in a maximum. Another mode starts oscillating before because it has a higher K or something, it ends up in zero. I don't know, I didn't, okay? All the modes of a given K everywhere in the universe, they are all synchronized, okay? And at recombination, some of them are at a maximum, some of them are at a minimum. They are all synchronized because they started outside of the horizon and, and this story, okay? So when I look at the CL modes and I'm measuring Fourier modes over there, over there in my CMB experiment, they're all synchronized. They all go through a mode of a given K over there and over there, over there. They go through zero exactly at the same time, okay? And those correspond to the minimum or the maximum of this curve corresponds to the K modes that given the frequency that they have, they will add recombination, they will get to a maximum or to a minimum, okay? But this phase, who gets it to be the maximum, who gets to be at a minimum at the time of recombination is just fixed. There's no choice just from having started outside the horizon, okay? So I see these patterns of peaks because I started with things outside the horizon and the phase at which modes get here is fixed, okay? No, no, play, no gain. No. Except instead of inflation, I have uh, the competing, um, the, or used to be, the competing, uh, the competing alternative which was that I don't start, and more reasonable, I would think, maybe for many purposes, at least for these alternatives, I don't start with super horizon stuff. I produce everything inside the horizon, okay? I have some cosmic strings, they move around, they stir matter, I don't know, whatever you want, explosions of this and that, I don't know, pick up your story, okay? You pick up your story inside the horizon, something random, boom, boom, explodes, creates some waves, okay? You do it inside the horizon. Inside the horizon, cosine omega t, sine omega t, cosine omega t plus pi over, all the same, okay? They all are nice solutions, just as fine. So explosion over there happens first, then explosion over there, explosion happens different. So you launch these waves with arbitrary phase, okay? You have some random process, explosions, cosmic strings, whatever you want, that launches these waves in a random manner. Inside the horizon, phases are just random, there's, no, there's nothing bad about cosine omega t versus sine omega t, okay? So you don't have all the modes synchronized, so when you get to recombination, over there, this particular Fourier mode of this particular k in that direction is at a maximum. The one over there is at a minimum, and you don't have a particular synchronization. So the peaks are gone, okay? Because the peaks are there because each Fourier mode of a given k gets to recombination with the exact same phase, maximum or minimum, because it started outside the horizon, okay? So anything you like to do inside the horizon, okay, um, in a more or less random fashion will not produce peaks, 
Okay, well, so when the peaks were seen, end of story for all of this, all of this, uh, yeah. Um, uh, the, the modes for which this decay should not occur, because we are of the side that the upper radius of the is greater, are never important. So, uh, well, in the context of inflation, uh, there's a lot of this decay of the decaying mode, even during inflation itself. Okay, so if you talk during inflation, but the ex it's true that the modes that are of the size of the Hubble radius, they were, I don't even know if they were already frozen, and I don't know how to discuss them very much, but they are so tiny that they usually, um, so they're definitely not important for structure formation. They might be important, uh, so what happens at reheating, maybe if reheating happens sufficiently, uh, sufficiently late, uh, you know, that you, you might uh, have uh, gravitational wave emissions that you might see at uh, some gravitational wave detector one day if the frequency is right and so on. But for the most part, these are minuscule scales. So, um, you know, we, we have sampled maybe, you know, 10 orders of, less than 10 orders of magnitude from, the, from our Hubble horizon. So that's what we do for structure formation. From our horizon, maybe 10 orders of magnitude smaller scales. That's kind of what we discuss. Um, this is e to the 60, okay? So these are very small. Uh, any other question? Yeah? Yeah. Well, there's, I mean, there's one, this is a choice of your variables, but there's one that becomes much bigger than the other one, exponentially much bigger, because, uh, you know, these will be factors of the uh, ratio of the A's to some power, okay? So, in, the, in that gauge that you're using, everything is growing and everything looks uh, like, uh, you know, the thing is, very, is becoming very inhomogeneous, but there's, in any case, one that dominates over the other. So the phase is fixed by the one that dominates, okay? The me of course, this exponential growth that you're seeing, once you calculate what we actually observe, miraculously has to go away because we still see 10 to minus five, but that's, you can work with whatever. Okay, any other questions about this? No? Okay, so, um, good. So, um, okay, so, um, let's see. Okay, so um, so now we know what the so 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 this is our basic story. Okay, that we launch the modes outside of the horizon, then they start oscillating. The phase is fixed. We will have some specific phase as a function of time. The velocity will be just from the continuity equation, we'll have the other phase, okay? Delta dot will be proportional to V, so, so, so we know what the density and velocities are, and then we will sort of figure out uh, how those things uh, map into what we see at the CMB. So what we have been able to more calculate, and you will do it if, you, if, if in a problem, you know, solve the equations more ac uh, correctly, these four equations. What we have done is you start with, uh, with uh, um, some fluctuations, if you want, in zeta in the initial conditions, and they, you let them evolve, and you figure out how delta is as a function of, of time for a given Fourier mode. And so now, um, so let me maybe. So now, so we have that plot that we had over there, our last scattering surface. Something that started as, uh, e, so some e to the ikx Fourier mode that you started with, okay? Times some time dependence, which for, and, and, and let's say we are trying to compute here the density of the material and its velocity and so on. Times some time dependence, which let me call it for the purpose of this cosine omega t plus, well, let's, so, something. Uh, this would be, for example, the density. Okay, and we are here, and we will then need to figure out what we will see as a function of, uh, of angle on the sky. The angular structure is all given by e to the i k x, right? This is k. So as I move in this direction, I go from the maximum to the minimums of the spatial part, okay? 
This part is a fixed amplitude for a mode of a given k, okay, omega. For a mode of a given k, this is a fixed amplitude as a function of time because I evaluate this at recombination, okay? Fixed amplitude as a function of time, but I will see as a function of angle in the sky, I will go from maximum to minimum, from maximum to minimum, okay? So the typical angle that, that I will need to go from maximum to minimum has to do with k and the distance, right? So this distance to the last scattering surface, let's, let me call it d. So from going to here to there, the angle has to do with basically k times d, okay? That, or, or, yeah, or one over k times d, that would be the angle. Um, but modes of different wave number, two things happens when I consider modes of different wave number. If, say, if it's a smaller wave number, I will need to, these planes will be closer together, so I will need to move a, a smaller angle in order to go from the maximum to the minimum. Okay? And they will have reached recombination with a different phase. Okay? So what we need to do then is combine uh, and figure out for a given K mode, what is the temperature that I would observe uh, in, my, in my telescope as a function of the properties of the material in this location. Okay? We have calculated these, say, we have basically calculated these things. And the gravitational potential is also something that we have calculated, although I haven't talked about it very much. Uh, it's part of what I need to, in order to solve these equations. I will have these. I will know how the gravitational potential, well, in space, everything is e to the ikx. And then I will have their time, sol the time evolution, OK? So, so um, yeah. So, so. Um, And I'll discuss this a little bit more next class, but let me just write down what the formula is. So the temperature that I see in a given direction of the sky will be just given by some formula like this. So delta gamma over 4, rho in the, in the, in the photons goes as t to the fourth. So delta gamma is four times delta t over t. Delta gamma over gamma is four de t times delta t over t. So if I, if I want to know uh, the temperature I would see of the black body spectrum coming from this direction, okay? So there is this little piece of plasma. It has some density. It has some velocity. The velocity, by the way, is always along the direction of k because everything is the gradient of some potential. Um, so it will be the temperature that I will observe here it has to do with the temperature that was there, okay? So this is just the fluctuations in the temperature in that spot compared to this other spot, compared to this other spot, and so on. This is just Doppler shift, okay? If this is moving, all of the photons coming from here will, uh, will, um, will be Doppler shifted, okay? Or blue or red shift, depending on whether it's moving towards us or... And then there, there will be a gravitational potential redshift. Okay, and this is this. So this is what we observe. This is what we've just calculated. And so with these two formulas, we will be able to sort, uh, sort out those peaks in a second, uh, or next class, because I, I want to do it more, more slowly. Um, but so then le let, me, let, me, let me make a few remarks, given that I'm not going to do that. Um, first remark. You know, this is the formula that we would obtain in the Newtonian gauge, okay? And this is where we've calculated things, and I will write down some more explicit formulas next time so that we see the parameter dependencies and so on. Um, just, um, just, um, Just as a cautionary note, many of the so so you, you you will get this formula. I just told you the 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 different terms what they are. If the temperature there was slightly different, blah blah blah. This would be this. The gravitational potential ratio is this and that. All of, all of these words, especially when mo we are considering modes that are outside the horizon, are you know extremely dubious uh, ways of, uh, of talking about things. Very gauge dependent. If you do this in another gauge, you will attach different words to it, okay? 
In particular, one thing that it's very important for you to, to keep in mind is that um, imagine that we are talking about a mode that is so long that it's outside the horizon during recombination, okay? But it's smaller than our current horizon. So let's say it's so long that it's like just has one maximum and one minimum over there, or like, you know, something like that. So it's hot, so it's one temperature over here, another temperature over there, another temperature, so just a few going around, very long wavelength mode. Compared to the horizon at recombination, negligibly long wavelength, or very long wavelength, inside the horizon barely now, okay? So the first thing that you must, uh, if you solve in these equations, you will find some delta gamma even for that mode. It will be something. But the very important thing that you will need to know is that if you were an observer at recombination there, you would see nothing, okay? This very long wavelength mode is not affecting at all what's happening there, okay? So if rather than just us looking at the CMB, we're receiving messages from the people here telling us, you know, our oh, recombination happened, at half of the recombination I see this, we have blah, 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 and send the message, okay? Those messages will be totally identical. There's nothing different for this long wavelength mode. There's nothing different in the way recombination is happening, anything that they can detect, okay, as they move around this circle. These are completely, a thing that's completely outside their horizon, they see nothing, okay? We then see some, we will eventually see um, um, some, uh, some, um, some difference in temperature just all through, in some sense, projection type effects. The, the gravitational redshift from that region or the velocity of that region with respect to us will be different and, 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 and so we will see some, some, uh, some temperature the, uh, differences in our sky because now this mode is inside our horizon and so we'll start to notice differences between the patches. But if you were there, you would see nothing. So in fact, for example, if you were doing this calculation in the zeta gauge, you've taken surfaces of constant density as your clock. There manifestly, the people there for the long wavelength mode see nothing. And all of the, what's called the Sachs-Wolf effect, which is the, the, the value of the delta T over T for modes outside the horizon, it's all some projection. It's nothing to do with what was happening there. So just to keep in mind that, especially for modes outside the, or for modes outside the horizon, nothing is different at recombination that anybody there could have measured, okay? Even though we will see some differences in temperature and some of which in some gauge we will ascribe to the fact that there it was hotter than here, but no, that's, that's just words, okay? Um, so that's one, one comment. And the other comment that I wanted to make is that uh, um, these oscillations that we have just, so there's, there's one very important fact that I left out for solving these equations, which is the fact that uh, this mean free path uh, of, the, of the photons are not, um, is not zero. This recombination happening instantaneously from minuscule mean free path in which I can take these photons and baryon fluid as one single fluid and the dark matter as some other fluid is not correct in the sense that the mean free path even before recombination starts, is, is not so, so small, okay? So that, if you, you can think of this, in, if, you're, if you like thinking about fluids, you, 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 you have to take into account the first type of uh, corrections uh, um, um, having to do with the mean free path. For example, you could go to Weinberg book, look at the t -Munu for, uh, you know, a fluid with, you'll find some viscosity, basically. You go to t -Munu, a fluid with, some viscosity has to do with the mean free path, and rather than doing my conservation of Timunu, just add that, use that Timunu, and you will have basically damping of these oscillations, okay? It's called silk damping, and I will do the estimate of how big that is uh, uh, next class, but that's responsible for the decay of the Doppler peaks as, as a function of, uh, of L that we will discuss next, next class. So, um, um, yeah, so, so, so in a sense, um, okay, and, 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 um, and, and then let me stress then the other thing that I wanted to stress is, the, is uh, when, when you write those equations that, that I wrote down and you will look at them and try to solve them in the computer, notice that because we're talking about redshift of a thousand 
All the things that will be important there are the density of matter, baryons, and so on. At that time, those only depend on omega matter and H square, omega BH square, that's the only, and those are the only parameters that will, that will, um, will appear, and those set the, the, the structure of those peaks and those scales that are in there are just set by those parameters. There will be more than one scale that we will be able to talk about. There will be the scale of the, of the separation of the Doppler peaks, which is just given by the sound horizon that we will discuss. There's this damping scale, there's the matter radiation equality scale. They all depend slightly differently on these parameters. So omega BH square and omega matter H square will be very well determined by the time we measure this accurately as we have, okay? Uh, but, um, um, okay, so, so, so let me stop there.